Hey there, fellow trainers. Have you ever had an encounter and thought to yourself, should I catch or pass? Or perhaps you're merely wondering which encounters are the most desirable. Well, today we're going to give you those answers as we review the various Pokemon that can be found on routes 19 to 23, the enigmatic Seafoam Islands, the volcanic Cinnabar Island, the tranquil Pallet Town, the bustling Viridian City, Victory Road, and Cerulean Cave. As we step outside of the Pokemon Center, into the open air, we make our way south and are met with a crisp seaside breeze, a long stretch of beach, and a singular cabin nestled cozily between the cliffs and the coastline. Making our way further out, will eventually be forced to leave the comfort of dry land to take a dip into the deep, sparkling blue ocean waters of Routes 19 and 20. Amidst the depths of this ocean, we can find various water-dwelling Pokémon, such as Tentacool, Tentacruel, and Staryu. Of these three, we have one that we've never encountered before, namely Staryu. So let's start by taking a look at everyone's favorite starfish. Now, Staryu exhibits all the telltale markers of being a glass cannon. It has low bulk with a base HP and defense stat of 30 and 55, respectively. Meanwhile, it boasts notably high offensive stats with a base special and speed stat of 70 and 85, respectively. However, it should be noted that when exposed to a water stone, it gains a significant boost to its base stats upon evolution into Starmie. Despite this, Starmie is still a glass cannon, much like its prior form Staryu, but is notably more powerful, having increased bulk with a base HP and defense stat of 60 and 85 respectively. Meanwhile, it also sees a sizable improvement to its offensive stats, with a base special and speed stat of 100 and 115, respectively. Sadly, like with most stone evolutions, this comes with a trade-off, as Starmie learns absolutely nothing via level up, and can only learn moves via TM and HM. Now, Fortunately, this doesn't hurt this Pokémon's viability much, as it has a versatile array of moves that can be taught in this manner, and the base stats to warrant the investment. Overall, I'd say catch this one, and save a few select TMs for its use. Now, as we make our way further west, we'll stumble across a pair of islands standing tall amidst the crashing waves. Jagged rocks fence them in and weather the tides, while verdant wildlife and dense foliage coat the surface. However, what we're here for lays deeper inland. A multi-level cavern for which the Seafoam Islands are known for, and where one of the legendary bird trio resides. In this dimly lit cavern, Water flows freely and wildly, crashing against the foundations and forming the various waterways we see in the depths of this subterranean lair. Amidst the chaos of this sunken landscape, we can encounter the following Pokémon. Zubat, Golbat, Slowpoke, Slowbro, Seal, Dugong, Krabby, Kingler, Staryu, Tentacool, and the legendary Articuno. Of these 11 encounters, we have three that we've never seen before, namely Seal, Dugong, and Articuno. So let's start with the eponymous Pokemon Seal, and its evolved form, Dugong. Looking at their base stats, they seem to be well-rounded Pokemon, with no stats standing out significantly above the others. However, for the sake of clarity, let's do a more thorough breakdown of their stats. They boast significant bulk, 
with Seal having a base HP and defense stat of 65 and 55, respectively. Meanwhile, Dugong boasts a base HP stat of 90 and a base defense of 80. Both have respectable offensive stats, with Seal having a base attack of 45, a base special of 70, and a base speed of 45. While Dugong has a base attack of 70, a base special of 95, and a base speed of 70. To complement these balanced and well-rounded base stats, they can learn a variety of moves via level up, TM, or HM. Seal learns the powerful Ice Beam at level 50, and Dugong learns it at level 56. Personally, I'd avoid using the TM for Ice Beam on this Pokemon, as it learns it naturally. But if you can't afford to wait, it's definitely an option. Of course, Surf is the best move you can teach it via HM, as it is the strongest Water-type move available. From personal experience, if you elect to use this Pokemon, I'd recommend the moveset of Surf, Ice Beam, Substitute, and Rest. Now, overall, while there are certainly more powerful Ice-type Pokemon in the game, Generation 1 is arguably one of the only generations where Dugong and Seal had true value. So I'd say catch them, if only to have the option available, as this is one of the few opportunities they have to shine. Moving on to the legendary bird Pokemon Articuno, we are presented with a dilemma. Looking at its base stats, it's clearly a powerhouse of a Pokemon. However, for the sake of accuracy, let's do a detailed breakdown of the information provided. It has noteworthy bulk with a base HP stat of 90 and a base defense stat of 100, but its true strength lies in its offensive stats, boasting an astoundingly high base special stat of 125, as well as a base attack and speed of 85. It is truly an intimidating specimen to behold. That is until you realize the true downfall of this Pokemon, its available learn set. To say it's lacking in variety would be an understatement. I myself find it difficult to pick out a set of four moves to recommend as a viable move set. Overall, I'd pass on this one. There are far more viable Ice-type Pokemon out there with far more varied move pools to draw from. However, if you opt to use this Pokemon, the suggested move set I'd go with is either Blizzard or Ice Beam, along with the moves Fly, Toxic, and either Substitute or Whirlwind for the final move slot. Departing the Seafoam Islands and carving a path further west, we'll find our way to the volcanic landmass known as Cinnabar Island. A large, verdant landmass with a small but bustling town located at the base of a towering volcano. Cinnabar Island is a spectacle to behold. However, it is also home to a multitude of staryu, and that is really about all you can find when fishing here. The true draw of the area, however, comes from three buildings. The gym, the decrepit burnt ruins of the Pokemon Mansion, and the Pokemon Lab. We'll start by venturing to the southwestern tip of the island, to the Pokemon Lab, and make our way inside. Upon entry, we'll find a long hall with a series of doors, each leading to one of three rooms within the lab, and a portrait of the lab's founder framed proudly on the northern wall. This is a portrait of Dr. Fuji, whom we know as Mr. Fuji of Lavender Town, but he's not why we're here, so let's venture to the room on the far end of the hall. In this lab, we'll find a lone scientist pacing back and forth anxiously before his latest invention. If we approach him while holding either the Helix Fossil, Dome Fossil, or Old Amber, he will recognize them as the fossil remains of Ammonite, Kabuto, and Aerodactyl, and offer to resurrect them for us. 
All three of these fossil Pokemon have their uses, but to truly understand their worth, we need to take a closer look. So let's start with my personal favorite fossil Pokemon, Kabuto. Looking at the base stats, we can see that Kabuto starts off rather fragile. Despite having strong defensive bulk with a base defense of 90 due to its low base HP stat of 30. It does, however, boast strong physical prowess and offensive power with a base attack of 80, a base special of 45, and a base speed of 55. This only gets better with its evolution into Kabutops. Kabutops sports impressive bolt, with a base HP stat of 60 and a base defense of 105. It also boasts improved offensive stats, with a base attack of 115, a base special of 70, and a base speed of 80. Its viability is only improved by the versatility of its learn set, which can manage to take advantage of its physical prowess while still providing some applicable use of its less noteworthy base special stat. While I'm admittedly slightly biased, I would still recommend this Pokemon, as it is absolutely viable in this generation. However, if you do opt to use it, I would specifically recommend the moveset of Hydro Pump, Slash, Submission, and Swords Dance. Moving on to the fossil counterpart of Kabuto, the veritable Ammonite, who is often referred to by fans as Lord Helix. Now, Ammonite is admittedly better suited for its typing in this generation, despite being as equally fragile as Kabuto prior to evolution, with a base HP stat of 35 and a base defense of 100. It, however, boasts a surprisingly strong base special stat, with a value of 90. Sadly, its base attack doesn't fare nearly as well, and it is the slowest of these three fossils with a pathetic base speed of 35 and a base attack of 40. While its base attack notably improves upon evolution, its speed is unfortunately still abysmal as Omastar. Omastar has substantially improved defensive bulk with a base HP stat of 70 and a base defense of 125. Its base special stat, however, remains a noteworthy point amongst the rest, with a value of 115. That being said, its base attack stat is notably improved with a respectable value of 60. Unfortunately, it's still as slow as molasses, with a base speed of 55. While I'm definitely not a fan of this Pokemon, I won't deny that it has its place in the roster. It is certainly capable of putting out significant damage with its moves, which managed to largely take advantage of its superior base special stat. However, unfortunately, just like with Kabutops, it doesn't learn any rock-type moves to take full advantage of the stat mechanic. So, if you were to use this Pokemon, I would recommend a move set of Hydro Pump, Surf, Ice Beam, and Toxic. Finally, we come to the third and fastest of the trio of fossil Pokemon, the Speed Demon Aerodactyl. Boasting noteworthy defensive bulk, with a base HP stat of 80 and a base defense of 65, Aerodactyl can certainly take a beating. Its true potential, however, is realized with its strong offensive stats with a base attack of 105, a base special of 60, and an absurd base speed of 130. It should be noted that out of all the Pokemon in the game in Generation 1, only two Pokemon tie with Aerodactyl on base speed, namely Jolteon and Mewtwo. However, it should also be pointed out that only one Pokemon in this generation actually outclasses it on base speed. Which Pokemon is that, you might ask? Well, it's none other than Electrode. Moving back to the matter at hand, however, 
Aerodactyl seems to be a powerhouse of a Pokemon. Sadly, it's marred by a lackluster learn set that limits its viability. Oddly enough, as seems to be a trend among the fossils, it learns no Rock-type moves in Generation 1, and thus can only take advantage of its Flying-type for stab bonuses. Overall, it's not a bad Pokémon to use, but there are certainly better options. If you were to opt to use this one, I'd suggest a move set of Fly, Double Edge, Toxic, and either Substitute or Whirlwind as the final move slot. Departing the lab and making our way to the northwestern tip of Cinnabar Island, we're met by a massive structure. The burnt down and dilapidated building known only as the Pokemon Mansion. Cautiously, we step inside as the scent of charcoal fills the air. In this charred and collapsing structure, we'll find various Pokemon lurking amidst the ruins. On the first floor, we can find Rattata, Raticate, Growlithe, Grime, and Muck in plentiful quantities. Now Growlithe is arguably a favorite of many trainers. However, upon examining its base stats, it is fairly unremarkable. It's rather fragile. With a base HP stat of 55 and a base defense of 45, it does boast decent offensive stats with a base attack of 70, a base special of 70, and a base speed of 60. But it doesn't truly become noteworthy until it's exposed to a Firestone. Upon exposure, it evolves into Arcanine. Now, Arcanine is a truly well-rounded powerhouse of a Pokémon. With a base HP stat of 90 and a base defense of 80, it has considerable bulk. It also boasts improved offensive stats, with a base attack of 110, a base special of 80, and a base speed of 95. The flaw with Arcanine, however, comes from the same place as all other stone-based evolutions. It can't learn moves via level up. It does, however, boast a varied, but admittedly small, learn set from TMs and HMs. Thus, the solution is to wait until Growlithe learns Flamethrower at level 50 before exposing it to a Firestone. Overall, it's a Pokémon worthy of investment, but, as with other stone evolutions, timing is everything. If you do decide to make use of this Pokémon, I would suggest the move set of Flamethrower, Body Slam, Toxic, and either Roar or Substitute as the final move slot. Now, as we make our way further, we ascend the stairs onto the second and third floor, where we can find nothing but Rattatas, Raticates, Grimers, and Mucks, scampering about the decaying structure. With nothing new to find on the upper floors, we descend to the basement. Smog fills the air like a dense mist, clouding our vision and choking the air from our lungs. The foundations of the manor still bear the scars of a fire long past. Amidst these toxic fumes and the burnt foundations, we can once again find radicates, grimers, and mucks wandering about but we can also find a most unusual resident, the enigmatic Ditto. Now, Ditto is a peculiar Pokémon and the source of many series. One such series relates to Mew, the elusive 151st Pokémon, and a potential connection it has with Ditto. Upon first glance, Ditto is absolute garbage, with all of its base stats having a value of 48. Its strength, however, comes from how the mechanics of the move Transform works. To elaborate, when a Pokémon uses Transform in Generation 1, it retains all of its DVs, but copies the raw stat values of the opposing Pokémon, along with any active boosts they may have. 
For example, suppose we have a Kabutops with an attack stat of 135, which is used Swords Dance. If Ditto uses the move Transform, it will have the exact same attack stat of 135 plus the bonus gained from Swords Dance. It will not, however, copy the HP stat of the opposing Pokémon. So even if the Kabutops had an HP pool of 135 and Ditto had an HP pool of 123, using Transform would not cause it to change to match Kabutops' HP pool and it would remain at 123. Overall, it's an interesting gimmick. But with how fragile Ditto is, it has limited application. I would advise you to pass on this encounter, as there are far better Pokemon out there, and it's simply not worth it. Climbing out from the rubble, we make our way north to Route 21, a long stretch of ocean water with a small outlet containing a grassy hillside bordering Pallet Town. Amidst the ebb and flow of the ocean waves, we can find several water-dwelling Pokémon, such as Tentacool, Tentacool, and Staryu. On the grassy hillside on the northern tip of the route, however, we'll find nothing but Pidgeys, Pidgeotos, Rattatas, and Raticates frolicking amongst the tall grass. With nothing new present, we'll move right along, back to where it all began. Pallet Town. In this quaint little village by the sea, a soft seaside breeze caresses us as the ocean waves crash and recede on the southern coast, creating a calming atmosphere befitting this tiny little hamlet. However, this place is also the home of the world-famous Pokemon professor, Professor Oak. And if we were to stop by his lab once we've completed the Pokedex, well... He might just have a surprise for us, but we're not here to make a social call at the moment, and we'll instead take a break to do some fishing. Heading to the coastline on the southern tip of Pallet Town, we can find nothing but Tentacool and Starnie swimming about the deep ocean waters in copious quantities. Seeing that there is nothing new of note, We'll depart along Route 1 and make our way back to Viridian City. Here is where we'll finally find something new, as the small pond on the southwestern corner of Viridian City is home to the Pokemon known as Poliwag. Now, Poliwag and its evolved form, Poliwhirl, are both reasonably well-rounded Pokémon stat-wise. However, they're not necessarily impressive. Poliwag is admittedly rather fragile and not particularly strong offensively, with a base HP, defense, and special stat of 40, and an attack stat of 50. Meanwhile, Poliwhirl fares not much better, with a base HP, defense, and attack stat of 65, and a base special of 50. The only noteworthy stat both Poliwag and Poliwhirl possess is their base speed, which has a value of 90. However, if you expose Poliwhirl to a Water Stone, it evolves into Poliwrath. Upon evolution, it loses some of the agility of its former stages, but gains a notable boost to the rest of its base stats. Boasting significantly improved bulk with a base HP and defense stat of 95, it can certainly tank some hits. Its offensive stats are also notably bolstered with a base attack of 95 and a base special of 70. All of this for the trade-off of a 20-point deficit in its base speed, which drops from 90 to 70. Personally, I say it's a worthwhile trade-off. Now, unlike most stone evolutions, it does learn a few moves via level up. 
Sadly, it's nothing all that useful. However, as the bulk of its repertoire is shackled to its prior form of Poliwhirl. As you can see, Poliwhirl has access to powerful moves via level up, which you lose access to upon evolution. My advice is to wait until it learns Hydro Pump at level 49 before exposing it to a Waterstone. Overall, it's a worthwhile investment, but timing is key. Personally, I'd recommend the move set of Hydro Pump, Submission, Blizzard, and Earthquake as Polyrath is a viable mixed sweeper and will want to take full advantage of its dual typing for stab bonuses while covering weaknesses. Carving our way further west, we pass through Route 22 and make our way to Route 23. On this long winding pathway leading to Victory Road, We'll find various Pokémon dwelling in the diverse and varied landscape, such as Spiro, Firo, Nidorino, Nidorina, Mankey, Primate, Poliwag, and Poliwhirl. With nothing new of note to be seen, we'll make our way deeper into the route and delve into the depths of the mountainside, climbing our way up through the series of cavernous chambers and winding tunnels known as Victory Road. On the first and lowest level of this cavern, we'll find copious amounts of Zubat, Geodude, Graveler, and Onyx roaming the winding passageways. However, as we make our way higher up to the second level, we'll start to see more variety. It's here that we can find not only the legendary bird Pokemon Moltres, but also other cave-dwelling Pokemon such as Zubat, Golbat, Machop, Machoke, Geodude, Graveler, Onyx, and Marowak. Now, out of all of these Pokemon, only Moltres stands out amongst the crowd. Upon first glance, it appears to be a powerhouse, much like Articuno and Zapdos. However, as we all know, looks can be deceiving. Still, for the sake of being thorough, let's break down their base stats. Moltres has impressive bulk, with a base HP and defense stat of 90. It also boasts praiseworthy offensive stats, with a base attack of 100, a base special of 125, and a base speed of 90. So where's the rub, I hear you ask? Well, to answer that question, we have to look at its learn set. Much like Articuno, it lacks variety, but sadly it's a little worse for Moltres. Since there is no Flamethrower TM until Generation 3, the only Fire-type moves it can learn are Fire Spin via Level Up and Fire Blast via TM. This hurts far more than you'd think, as Fire Blast has only 5 uses, and Fire Spin is not reliably accurate. That being said, Fire Spin can work as a cheese tactic, due to how moves like Wrap, Clamp, and Fire Spin work in Generation 1. In this generation, they essentially stun lock the enemy and prevent them from attacking, effectively dealing damage with no risk. Overall, I wouldn't recommend this Pokemon, but if you must use it, I would advise the moveset of Fire Blast, Fly, Fire Spin, and either Toxic, Substitute, or Whirlwind as the final move slot. Now, as we make our way back into the open air, we'll fly our way back to Cerulean City. From here, we head north across Nugget Bridge on Route 24, before taking a dip into the waters and heading south. This will lead us back to a canal on the northern side of the city limits, which we will follow until we reach a plot of dry land at the end of the waterway. Once more, 
having set foot on dry land, will find the gaping maw of a cave before us. This is the dreaded Cerulean Cave, a place where only champions may tread. In the gloom of this cave, we can find various Pokemon, such as Sandslash, Golbat, Gloom, Weepin' Bell, Gravelor, Rhyhorn, Rhydon, Ditto, Parasect, Venomoth, Lickitung, Chansey, Goldeen, and Seeking. All of these are Pokemon we have seen before, and are not what we're here for. No. What we're here for lies further in, deep underground. There dwells a monster of our own making. July 5th, Guyana, South America. We discovered a new Pokemon deep in the jungle. July 10th, we christened the newly discovered Pokemon, Mew. February 6th, we obtained a new Pokemon from Mew. We have named this Pokemon, Mewtwo. September 1st, Pokemon Mewtwo is far too powerful. It's no use. I cannot control it! Now, I don't need to be the one to tell you that Mewtwo is an impressive Pokémon. But this is truly a monster. With unprecedented bulk, having a base HP stat of 106 and a base defense of 90, it can take a lot of punishment. It also boasts absurdly powerful offensive stats, with a base attack of 110, an unheard of base special of 154, and an impressive base speed of 130. This level of power is only magnified by just how broken the Psychic type is in Generation 1. Due to a programming error, Ghost type moves had no effect on Psychic type Pokemon. This ultimately didn't matter much, as there were no powerful Ghost type moves at the time, with the only non-fixed damage and non-status move being Lick. Bug types also presented little to no real threat, as there were no powerful bug type moves in Generation 1, with the strongest attack being the multi-hit move, Pin Missile. However, it also boasted an impressive variety in its learn set, with a host of powerful moves learned via Level Up, TM, and HM. Unlike its progenitor Mew, though, it couldn't learn everything and had its limits. Of course I would recommend catching this Pokémon. It's an undeniably powerful asset and will make any challenges in the future seem trivial. If I was to recommend a move set, I would suggest going with Psychic, Thunderbolt, either Amnesia or Fire Blast, and for the final move slot, Recover. Now I hear you ask, why bother with Amnesia? Surely it's powerful enough already. Well, you should never underestimate the power of setup moves like Amnesia, Swords Dance, and the like. Since the special stat is used both defensively and offensively, Amnesia boosts its survivability and power at the same time. This will allow it to deal devastating damage with its attacks regardless of type, but it can admittedly do that without a boost from Amnesia. So if you want to have more coverage, take Fire Blast. If you want to just pump out damage regardless of type, take Amnesia. 
Now, if you have any strategies, tips, or ideas relating to any of the encounters thus far that I didn't mention, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Your input is always welcome here. And with that, we're all out of time for today. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more exciting content. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, and thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.